across Denver's. Hello. We are so glad that you decided to come out tonight. We would love for you to stand and join us as we worship and as we sing. Like a covenant of old And your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today And faithful you have been And faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
think it's a good day to celebrate our God. What do y'all think? Yep. Well, again, I hope you hear just how happy we are that we get this chance to celebrate our God together uh, with each and every one of you. And it's our greatest hope and prayer that from the very second you pulled into the parking lot, you felt welcome. We have signs around our church that say, welcome home. And it's so much more than just two words, right? That's our hope. It's our, it's our heart that you feel welcome here and that you feel connected. And so even as you continue to walk into this room and we worship and sing these songs, um, I just want to encourage you to sing out and to worship God however it is that you do that. There'll be some of us that are singing out, raising our hands. Some may just need to sit down and listen and let it pour into your heart. And that's perfectly fine. So just know that you are welcome and encouraged to worship him however it is that you do it. We're going to sing out the name of Jesus. And as we do, I just encourage you to remember that as we follow him with our whole hearts, we truly can find freedom. So sing that, sing his name over everything in your life. And let's see what he does with the chains that are holding us back. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name and still. Call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every wave at your name we sing, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness this tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live, and call these lungs to sing once again. Oh, I will pray. Yeah. 
today, Jesus. We sing your name over all the blessings and we say thank you, Jesus, because we believe they came from you. And then we sing, we sing your name over the, the darkness and the hardships, the struggles, the doubts, the confusions. We sing we sing Jesus, and we sing it because we know that you have strength that surpasses anything and everything we could ever even imagine, and it's the strength that we need desperately to keep walking, to keep taking one step in front of the other. We need to find freedom that only you can provide. While we're trying to find it in so many places, we just need a freedom that only you can give us. So help us today, help us to, to keep seeking you, to keep growing closer to you. And in those places where we still find darkness, God, help us, help us just to keep singing your name, Jesus. To have faith you go before us, that you hold us in the palm of your hands and you never ever let us go. We're so grateful for you. 
all of this, all of these songs and the singing and the praise, it's it's a hundred thousand percent just for you. We love you and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Whew. It's such an honor to be able to be here with y'all. It's such an honor that we get to all be here and sing no matter what we're going through, no matter what stage of life we're in, that we have this in common, that life is life and we're all going through different things, but God is God and he is good all the time. So whether you can hold on to that or not yet, I encourage you to believe it, even if it's, it's doubtful right where you are in your season. We're going to continue to learn more about him today together. We're going to worship him and we're going to and learn more about him. And for me in my life, there's been a lot of ways I've learned about God, but one of the biggest ways, ironically enough, has been through my children. <laughs> And so we're going to take some time and take some wisdom from them right now. So CT Kids is going to give us some, some info. Let's see what they have to teach us. Somebody tell me what it means when we say, like at Cross Timbers, we say, we say this all the time. We want you to be generous. Noah, what's it mean to be generous? Giving and telling about God. Sharing a little bit of what you have with somebody else, right? Okay, come here, Noah, since you, you answered that question so well. Here's how this is going to roll. All the way up here. Hang on, he's got to get a wardrobe change. Fantastic. Perfect. All right. Noah, I'm going to give you this. Do you know what this is? A penny. Try again. N dime. It's a dime. It was not a trick question. It was a little, I mean, it looked like it might be a penny, but it's a dime. It, it's, it's the lighting for sure. I'm going to give you this. And you said closed fist was better, right? Don't choke on it. Just hold it like this for me. Like this. And whatever I do, I'm not going to get that penny, okay? All right. Turn and face this way. Perfect. So all your friends can see. Does anybody know how much a dime is worth? Ten cents. Ten cents. Fantastic. Mark that on your stars test next week. Okay. So here's the thing. The Bible teaches that for everything that we get, we should give back a portion of what we've been given to help others, to ministry, to share with our friends and family, to help those in need, right? It's called being generous. But what happens if Noah here, he's earned a dollar, and now he's going to give a dime, whatever. Let's say you, you did a job, and you got paid a dollar, and now you've got a dime. You're going to give that dime. But what happens when Noah's living his life like this, when he's holding his hand like this, what happens? Can I get the dime? Oh, no, Hang, I face this way. There you go. Look, can I get it? He's too strong for me. I can't even pry his fingers off. <laughs> he's making sure I don't steal his dime. But if Noah changes his mind and says, you know what? I'm going to do open hand. Now look what happens. Look, I can take his dime. He can give it. Look, look, let go. Drop it. Boom. Now what happens is, is if you've given a little bit of what you've been blessed with, then what does the Lord get to do? So hold your hand open. Now look. Look. Now dump it out. Easy. They're just dimes. Nobody go crazy. Now show me, show me closed fist again. If you're living with a closed fist, look. You can't receive, except he's cheating. All right, now here's the other thing. You got one, fantastic. Now let, open hand, dump it out, perfect. Now watch this, you ready? Watch this. If we live, look at me right here. If we live open-handed and we're willing to share our stuff, then you know what God says? He says, then I'm gonna help you be a good share. Look right here, open your hands. Dump it out, dump it out. Now keep going, keep going. Look, dump it out, dump it out. Okay, now tell me this. How many of you say open hand is better, right? Open hand is way better, right? All the hands, open hand. So here's the thing, here's the thing right here, focus in. Here's the thing, when we're generous, when we live with an open hand, when we give and when we share what the Lord has given us, he's positioning us to receive all kinds of blessings, right? Not just money and not just stuff, but he's using us to be his hands and feet. And isn't that a better way to live than closed fist, right? Wasn't that awesome? I just love that um, analogy. My name is Katie Harbour and I'm the kids pastor here on the Denton campus. And I just love that we get to learn about how to live with an open hand, even in our kids ministry. Because if I'm honest, 
Uh, living with the open hand is hard, and it's a lot easier to live with the control all on my own strength. But when I open my hands up, it gives me the freedom to trust God with whatever else he has for me today. And so I wonder what that looks like for you today. I wonder if that's um, investing in one of our CT Kids ministries. Or I wonder if that's looking for a way to give back financially. And so today we're just gonna receive an offering together. And as we receive this offering, I just ask that you would be aware of what God is calling you to do. And so we are going to pray together and we'll get started after that. Father God, thank you so much that you get to teach us through children. Um, God, thank you that their faith is strong. And God, we thank you that we get to live generously because of what you've done for us on the cross. God, we just ask that you would just be honored with this opportunity to give today, God, and that everything that we do would be glorifying to you today, God. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. I know what you are searching for, wanderer, for peace, for comfort, for freedom. Have you felt lost? Have you felt empty? Have you felt alone? Have you felt like a slave to the search? desert feels dry and harsh, but I promise there is life in the desert. Follow me, wanderer. Find peace. Find comfort. Find freedom. It is great to be with you. My name is Toby. I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Timbers. And whether you're sitting in Argyle and Lake Cities on our Denton campus or even watching online, I just want you to know how happy we are that you've chosen to be with, especially a special welcome to those of you who are our guests. We know that we are kicking off the summer season kind of this weekend. Folks are getting out of school, beginning to travel. And I am taking this last step this weekend to finish the first half of a series that we've been in all year long called 40, where we've been learning that believing will save you, but it's following that will set you free. Come on, somebody. You want to be free. You can't stop at believing. you got to learn how to follow. And so we've just been talking about what does it mean to learn how to become a follower. It's been such an interesting, fun time. And I promised that before the summer started, we would get to the Red Sea. And so that's where we're going to be this weekend. If you have a Bible, a smartphone, open it up to Exodus 14. If you're on your smartphone, turn off Facebook and just get right over there to Exodus 14. We're going to begin there in just a moment. Let me just say this, though, as we begin. The summer months are always such a powerful time for us here at Cross Timbers. This summer is no different. We are taking a break this year from the almost 17-year tradition of a series called Real to Real because I want y'all to miss it. So we're going to take a year off, but we have another series for you that me and the teaching team have been working on. Our teacher team has been working really hard. Jay Utley, one of our teachers here, has been helping prepare us. And uh, we'll kick that series off next weekend, and then we're going to come back hard in the fall, back into 40. I know our kids are... You're going to see stuff about AMP, this experience for our kids this summer to help them learn how to follow Jesus and take a step toward the freedom that we all want to experience. Great, great things happening in our family. But 
This weekend, I want us to get right into Exodus 14. I'm going to tell you as we begin that if you've been coming to Cross Humans for a while, this is going to be a little bit of a different weekend for us. It's a little different than what we normally do, uh, but it's going to be good. So everybody just relax and take a breath. If you're new, you don't know any better, so it's great anyway. Okay, so Exodus chapter 40. I want to talk to you just a little bit this weekend about dead ends. I want to talk to you about not if, but when you find yourself stuck. I want to talk to you about the moments that every one of us experience where it seems like relationally, financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, we're just spinning our wheels. We're not at the top of the mountain. We might not even be in the valley of the shadow. We're just kind of stuck. I'm going to tell you a couple of things that if you've gone to church for a while, it's going to make you really, really uncomfortable. It just happens to be true. And then I'm going to give you the greatest news on the planet. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity this weekend to take your step toward freedom and getting unstuck from the place that you've been stuck for so long. Could you repeat after me? This could be the week. This could be the moment where God does what only God can do. Let's pray. So Holy Spirit, we invite you into the deepest recesses of our soul and hearts. We didn't come today to be educated. We came to be transformed. We believe that the name of Jesus still carries power. And that because you, Jesus, are alive, anything is possible for us. And so speak to us, even in the next few moments, Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this story in Exodus 14 is an interesting one. The Israelites have been supernaturally delivered out of Egyptian captivity. And we find at the end of Exodus 13, the Bible says that the Israelites are on the outer edges of the wilderness. They're about to begin their journey toward the promised land. But I want you to, I want you to see what Scripture says, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, come on somebody, everybody say, Turn back. To turn back and to camp near, near Pi-Haroth, because you don't know it, so I'm just going to make it up, between Migdal and the sea, they are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Now, I want you to see in these verses what God is up to. What God was up to then and what God is up to now. God is looking to gain his glory among people that don't know him. It is God's heart that everyone would begin to live in a way that they were designed to live. When you begin to function in the way that God designed you to function, the end result will be God will be glorified. It is possible to live with such a peace, such a hope, such a confidence, such a sense of centeredness that someone that doesn't know God would say this, only God could do that. And this is what God is trying to do through the Israelites, but it's interesting the way he chooses to do it because what the Bible says is, is that they're on the edge of the wilderness and now he has them turn back. 
He has them turn back. And this is, now there's no scholarly, like, concrete evidence for the exact place that they camped. But here's what we know. We know that they've come this way. They're headed this way. That around them here is a wilderness. And in front of them is a huge body of water. And we know that God has led them to this place. Well, there's wilderness beside them, water in front of them, and Egypt behind them. Now, I would imagine that among the Israelites, somebody said, you know what? This is a bad place to be if something bad's about to happen. I would imagine that there were some among the Israelites that were beginning to wander if Moses had lost his compass because they seem to be lost. And come on, ladies, you know men ain't stopping and asking for no directions. But you know, in my Bible, what I've written across the top of this little story, I've written this. God isn't lost. God led them to this dead end. Now just let that sink in for a moment. It sounds good on a Thursday or a Sunday at church. doesn't sound so good when you find yourself surrounded, does it? But God is at work. God's not lost. God is at work even in your situation where there seems to be no solution. And God is prepared to do something in a way that you could never even begin to ask or imagine. The story of Exodus 14 is the story of the coming of God in the flesh named Jesus. It is a prophetic foreshadowing of what God wants to do in your life and my life. That God is not asleep at the wheel. God is not lost. God has not forgotten you. You may feel like your ex-spouse led you to this place. You may feel like your boss or your employee who let you down or double-crossed you led you to this place. You may feel like it's a doctor who can't seem to get the diagnosis right that's got you to this place. But I'm telling you, on the authority of the Bible, God is in the middle of it all. And God is at work to do something through your life that people will say only God could do that. God isn't lost. Now look down at Exodus. Let's continue to read. Look down at verse 10 of Exodus 14. It says that as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified The Bible says, terrified, and this is interesting, it says they cried out to the Lord. Let me tell you why that language is interesting. It's the exact same language used when it said they were in Egyptian captivity, and they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard their cry. History is beginning to repeat itself. What seemed impossible is a recipe for the supernatural. And they cried out to the Lord. Now listen to what they said to Moses. This is interesting to me. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out in the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? Now listen to this. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. These are statements of fear. This is what fear does. Fear 
makes us vulnerable, vulnerable to the lies of the enemy, and we start believing in the wrong voice. See, the reason Jesus says more than anything else in his ministry, fear not, is because he knows the precarious position that fear brings you to. There is a place in fear when I give into it that crosses the line. There's a place where I begin to believe the voice that revises history to me. That says dumb things like it would have been better for us to make bricks in Egypt than to come out here into the desert. It's the voice that begins to believe that the God who delivered in the past is not willing or able to deliver in the future. See, fear would cause us to begin to believe a lie. But see, God isn't lost and the lie isn't true. The battle for your heart is not what you're surrounded by. The battle for your heart is what you're believing about God and yourself when you find yourself surrounded. You with me? God isn't lost. The lie isn't true. <laughs> look at Exodus. Now look down at verse 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. The exact words that are going to be spoken by Jesus over and over and over again. How dumb is it to tell somebody not to be afraid unless you can give them reason to not be afraid? Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Look, here it is. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be true confession time, Argyle, Lake Cities, Denton. How many of you have a hard time being still? Stillness seems un-American, doesn't it? There's flower beds to weed and dogs to walk and dishes to wash and clothes to be laundered. There's places to go, there's people to see, there's things to do. And this, this innate belief that stillness is a lack of productivity, look at me everybody, it is amplified when you find yourself surrounded. The answer is just do Something. But see, God's plan, God isn't lost. The lie isn't true. And the plan isn't normal. The plan is to not give in to the lies that the fear is making you vulnerable to. You see it? Fear not. Stand firm. Don't back up. Don't move forward. And you will see the Lord's deliverance. The Lord will fight for you. Just shh. See, what the Israelites don't understand it, God has perfectly positioned them to see his hand at work. The only way the plan gets jacked up is if they take matters into their own hands. I won't ask you to raise your hand. I'll just talk about me for a moment. 
of all my endearing qualities that I have for my wife, what's not on that list is the ability to fix anything. I'm the most unhandy, per, unhandy person you've ever met in your life. I mean, I can't fix nothing. Uh, my dad taught me one thing. He, here's, here's, the, here's how you use the phone book, and here's how you call somebody to fix stuff. That's what dad taught me. People have come over and asked to borrow my tools, and their first answer is, usually, that's all you got. Yeah, that's all I got. The reason I don't try to fix things anymore, look at me, everybody, it's because usually when I try to fix something, it ends up worse than when I started. I have tried to change garbage disposals and had to change out the entire sink. <laughs> I've dr- tried to do repairs on small appliances and found myself going and buying the newer model, costing twice as much. And what's true about me in the physical is true about me in the spiritual too. When I try to bring human solutions to supernatural problems, I'll find myself making the problem worse and not better. I'm not advocating inactivity. I'm advocating not moving until you are assured that God has called you to move. I'm talking about learning to follow the cloud, learning, training your ear to hear the voice of God, understanding that following God means at some point you will move forward, and the first step is always the hardest step. But left to my own devices, I will jack it up every time. And so will you. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord has, I don't care if he's positioned or allowed you to be positioned in this place, but he will bring deliverance if you will just shh and let him do his work. Yeah, but Toby, you don't understand how my world works. I don't know how your world works, but this is how the kingdom of God works. And you have to fight the urge to be human because the plan for you when you find yourself surrounded isn't your normal plan. And I think it's interesting to note and to understand that deliverance rarely comes in a way that you expect deliverance to come. But deliverance always comes. Now, I want you to think about this with me before we look at this last little passage. Because you know the end of the story. You've seen the Ten Commandments. I mean, come on, you, you know the story. But I want you to think with me for a moment. You have some people who have been supernaturally delivered. I'm, we're talking Steven Spielberg's JV compared to what they've seen. I mean, we've seen hail and locusts and fire. I mean, we've seen crazy stuff. Right? Only God. There's nobody going, wow, I wonder how that happened. Everybody knows how that happened, right? They've gone a mile out of uh, uh, five miles worth of people, miles out into the wilderness. They left as slaves. They plundered the Egyptians. What do you think they're doing? They're throwing a party. For the first time, they got resources and freedom. These women have never had any jewelry, ladies. And now they got all the Egyptian Jewelry, they're having the biggest cant and swap meet you've ever seen in your life. Hey, you take this, I'll take this. Hey, how about that? The dudes are over there like they have taken their best cows and they're barbecuing them. They're smoking them to the Lord because they ain't no vegetarians. They love God. I mean, they're eating meat. I'm teasing. Keep your emails to yourself. I just know it doesn't say kill the fatted cauliflower in the Bible. I know that for a fact. They're having a barbecue. They're, they're singing songs about how great God is. They're swapping jewelry and linen and all this stuff they got. And all of a sudden they see the clouds coming, this cloud of this army coming behind them. And the response should be, we ain't scared. God's got this. And they move from celebration to full-on anxiety and panic in a moment and give in to their fear and begin to speak this, basically, God, we don't trust God to take care of us. 
You ever been there? And you know the lie that gets you? The lie that gets you is not the lie that got you there. The lie that gets you is, well, God's angry because I'm not operating out of faith. If I was prayed harder, if I believed more, if I'd have just read my Bible more, if I'd have just gone to church more, if I'd have just joined more groups, surely God could get me out of this. The lie that you believe in that moment is that God's mad at you. So how does God respond to a group of faithless, fearful, believing the lie people? Well, again, you know the story. Moses stretches out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind. And he turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. See, the greatest news on the planet is, I don't know how you are responding to your situation. But I can tell you on the authority of scripture, God isn't angry with you. You have not disqualified yourself from supernatural deliverance you just need to let him do what he promises to do you are a product you know I've said this a lot lately but there ain't no unchurched people here there's previously churched people here your parents put you on a joy bus on a Sunday morning so your daddy could drink beer before the Cowboys game, and you decided when you turned 16, you were never going back to church again. That's the product. Most people in the Bible, Belt, that's what we're the products of, right? And you are the product, whether you went with your mom and daddy or they sent you on the bus, of a preacher banging his hand on a wooden pulpit telling you that you better turn or you're going to burn, and that somehow God was going to smite you if you didn't do better. It's just not the gospel. From this day in Exodus until this day, God has been in the delivery business. While you were still sinning, God delivered you through the blood of Jesus. You just need to... And let God do for you what you haven't been able to do for yourself. Your deliverance is coming as soon as you learn to let God do what only he can do. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, what... Dead ends will do to you. Isn't it? It's interesting what it will do to your heart and your spirit. I think it's funny that this week, this last week that was planned many weeks ago to be the week where I would teach on this topic to wrap up this first half of the year in this series that it would also be the week where an interview I did with one of our friends, Mike Foster, a church leader out in the kingdom. He has a little podcast. It's called Fun Therapy. It's a national podcast. And when he was here a few months ago, he sat down with me and we, he interviewed me about a 20-plus year battle with anxiety and panic. And today, it came out. And I started to get DM and PMs and text and every which way somebody could find ways to contact me, people I haven't heard from for years and people I don't even know. 
that just wanted me to know that the battle that I fight is the battle that they are fighting. And again, only God can orchestrate all this stuff because all day I've been kind of an emotional mess when you go back and live in the first history of that world and yet you see God at work in it all. And, but I'm, I'm vividly today remembering how my battles with anxiety and panic have not been about God taking away the anxiety and panic, but it's about how I respond in the moments when I feel surrounded. And I, I don't know what your deal is. Depression, anxiety, relational conflict, physical illness, mental illness, habitual sin that you can't seem to get past, being too mad, eating too much. I mean, pick your deal, whatever, everybody's got something. But in the moment that it kind of beats you down, that giant keeps taunting you across the You're David and Goliath, and Goliath's taunting you across that valley, and you can't seem to win. You feel surrounded. The answer, the question is, what do you do? So about four weeks ago, I was sitting on my little back screened-in porch of my little house out in Cook County, and it was about 4.15 in the morning. I hesitate to tell you this story because you guys that don't know me, some of you are going to think I'm a lot more spiritual than I am. I was sitting on the back porch because I was so troubled in my spirit that I couldn't sleep. And I was troubled in my spirit because my wife and I weren't seen eye to eye on some things in our lives. And that was causing me to doubt my leadership in my home spiritually. Because leadership is not me telling her I'm in charge. Leadership is me operating in a way that she sees it and goes, man, I'll, I'll follow that. Men, look at me. If you got to tell your wife that a leader, you ain't. Trust me. <laughs> and I was troubled about that rift in our relationship. On top of that, I'd just gotten word of a, young man in our church that I care a lot about who was battling a, a brain tumor and a dear friend on my staff who's fighting some ongoing chronic physical issues and a marriage that Mike and I knew about that wasn't just having a not see eye to eye. I mean, it was about broken. And we were wondering if God was going to put it back together. And so I'm troubled, and I'm sitting on my back porch, and I'm sitting in my chair. Now, look at me, everybody. God's everywhere, but God meets me in that little chair on my porch. I mean, I got, that's my spot. And I'm sitting there, and I'm praying. As some of you who don't know me, this may make you never want to come back to church here. Okay, whatever. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Like, as I prayed about it, like, a peace was not coming over me. I was just getting more anxious about it all. Because sometimes you start praying and pouring your life out to God, and there's a peace that comes with you. Sometimes it just makes it worse. You just do it anyway. And I got my Bible in my lap. Again, don't over-spiritualize this deal. I do use a regular Bible at home. It's more holy when I'm sitting in my spot. But it's sitting, it's lying there, and I've got a little Spotify music going on. Usually I'm listening to the Cross Timber Spotify, but this time I've just got like worship music on. And as I'm praying and just saying, God, are you going to fix this? And what about this? And I'm worried about this. And could you do something here? And I'm not, I'm just, you ever been there? It's just like, hey, 15 yards for piling on right now, God, really. Could you like give me a break here? And all of a sudden, a song I'd never heard started playing through my little telephone. It was this song. Listen to it. This is how I fight my battles. Thank you. 
this song goes on and on. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And I kid you not, I can't make this up. I look down at my Bible, and it's open to Exodus 14. It's God's people. The Bible, my, my NIV version says, hemmed in. My, like Toby's translation is, they were surrounded. And the fact of the matter is, you feel surrounded. But the greater reality is, you are surrounded by Him. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how little faith you've had, no matter how many ways you've tried to medicate this problem away, in the moment that you, He sends supernatural help into your life because nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. Nothing. You are surrounded by Him. And I think He wants to teach you a new way to fight. You know what? Here's what I think. I'm going to take a little risk. I've been... There are some of you sitting in Lake Cities right now, sitting in Denton right now, some of you in Argyle, that God is ready to move on your behalf. And whatever this thing that's around you, He's ready to bring deliverance and defeat from that. He's ready to overcome that in your life. I believe that, that this could be your moment that you see God supernaturally do something, but it won't be what you think it is. It'll happen in a way that you would never imagine. But some of you, God is going to give you a spirit to overcome what surrounds you, and what surrounds you will say exactly the same, but inside of you will never be the same. That God is not going to give you exactly what you want but you're going to find a peace and a strength in the moment of not yet receiving what you want the most. Because he's surrounding you. His ways are not your ways. I know what I'm talking about. And if he gave you what you wanted the most, you just want something else. So what if he gave you a spirit that said, yea, though they slay me, yet will I trust him. It is well with my soul. (laughs) And I think that's what the Lord wants to do. So I've gone way too long. And so I'm going to, in just a moment, hand this back to our campus pastors at all of our campuses today. But what I want to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to to take a step of faith. We're going to sing the song that you just heard together. All of our campus worship pastors are going to lead in a moment. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to pray and then they're going to sing this song and as we begin to sing this song we're going to do something we never do at Cross Timbers. We're going to have an old school, some of you know it as an altar call, I, you know but we're, I'm going to ask you to come and I'm going to ask you, you don't have to tell me what's going on, our prayer teams are going to come at all the campuses, you, you don't have to tell them what's going on but by you taking a step of faith in this way and saying I feel surrounded we're going to pray that God does something supernatural in your heart and your life You don't have to come up to the front for it to happen. I just think it's a step of faith you ought to take. So I'm going to ask everyone, all of our campuses, would you stand with me? Again, if you're new here, we we ain't into weird. We're not going to have some Holy Spirit rodeo and see how weird we can be. We're not. But what we're going to do is we're going to bow our heads and close. We're going to bow our heads, close our eyes, just so we can have a private moment. And some of us are going to open our hands like this. And the reason we're going to do it is because it's symbolizing God. Whatever you got for me, I want some of it. And we got some men who like it makes them uncomfortable, so they just do this. They just kind of open their hand like this. It's okay. God, see, we're going to open our hands. I'm going to pray. 
the bands are going to come. We're going to sing this song together. As you do, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. And let's let God do something in your life. Wherever you're sitting. Lake City's, maybe it's your first week, maybe it's your 50th week. Just come on, let's see if God might move on our behalf. You with me? Let's pray. Lord, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, you surround us, but it doesn't feel like it sometimes. We just get weary. It seems like the more we struggle, the more it stays the same. And so this day we declare that we need you to do what we haven't been able to do ourselves. We need the deliverer to come. We need a new way to fight. We need to let what we know begin to control what we feel. Nothing is more powerful than the blood of Jesus in our lives. And so, Lord, even today as we begin to sing this song together, I would pray that those who feel surrounded physically by physical illness, for those who feel financially surrounded, relationally surrounded, vocationally surrounded, those who battle anxiety, depression, those who find themselves medicating when they're in any form or fashion in a way that they know isn't healthy and they can't seem to get past it. Father, I would pray that this would be the moment that by faith you would begin to move in our lives. We are ready to receive whatever you have for us. And I thank you, Lord, for a love that is faithful when I am faithless. For a God who loves me when I should know better. And you come over and over and over again. So thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this together. This is how I fight my battles. And this is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles
Okay. If you're battling depression, anxiety, any in that area, that family, that hell-filled family, that's what you're battling. I want you to meet me right up here in the front. We're going to pray. I want you to come right up here. Now, I know there's some of you in here going, I ain't going up there. Come on. Come on up here. Let's pray, and let's see if the Lord will do something right here, okay? We're going to pray. Just get up in this little circle right here. We're going to keep singing. We're going to turn my mic off when I get down there. We're just going to pray and believe in faith that the Lord's going to lift something. All right? So come on over here. Right over here. Now look how many people this is, John Talker. Are you seeing this? Come on, epidemic. Over here. Come on. You are not alone. You are not the only one. It's a lie. You are not weak. You are not unspiritual. You're not unholy. All right, y'all sing, Jess. I'm going to pray over here. Y'all turn me off.
we serve a God that knows that we can feel surrounded and says, no, I'm here. I am with you. Be still. That is so difficult for me to do. I know it's difficult for all of us to do. But what is so good is that when we take a moment like what we just did from the chaos that's around us and we choose to be still, he shows up. And we realize he's been with us the whole time. Man, we're so thankful that you're here and we, we don't, we don't want to rush anything. If you need to stay, if you want prayer, we are going to be here. We would love for the opportunity to pray with you. And maybe you're here and something just really spoke to you tonight and you felt like God was saying, hey, it's time to take the next steps. It's time to know me more. Man, we have something called Pathway that we believe in so much here at Cross Timbers. And we believe that we're not all gonna be perfect followers, but we all wanna be better followers of Jesus. And we all wanna take our next step. And if you're interested in that, you can find information on our website or on our app to sign up. But right here, right now, we just wanna say thank you for being here tonight. It, it was incredible to get the opportunity to worship with you. And if you would like to receive prayer, we are going to be down here at the front. We don't wanna rush anything, but we're thankful that you're, you're here. And we're thankful we can, as a family, come together and be still and acknowledge that God is present in our lives. Thank you for being here. We can't wait to see you next week. Thank you.